Good morning, everyone. I'm Diane Ellis, the FDIC's Director of Insurance and Research. On behalf of the FDIC and our partners at Duke University, the Fuqua School of Business and Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative, welcome today's conference, FinTech and the Future of Banking. As you all know, there are many FinTech conferences to choose from nowadays. So when we started planning this conference last fall, we asked ourselves how we could add value to the long list of FinTech conferences already out there. What we've done today is bring together top-notch academics, industry experts, and policymakers with the belief that at the intersection of research and experience lies good public policy. I'm grateful to our partners at Duke for their support. It's thanks to their efforts that today we hear from the best academic work in this area. And to all of our panelists, thank you for your time uh, and sharing your knowledge and experience. Our program is a series of policy and research discussions. We have three research panels that address technology's impact on lending, decision making, and competition. We've asked our academics to focus their remarks on the big picture questions, findings, and the implications of their work. We've also invited senior leaders in policy and the industry to serve as moderators and discussants. Their role would be to weigh in on that research presented through the lens of their practical experience. Mixed in with the research panels are two policy discussions. The first will focus on regulatory innovation, and the second will provide insights from experienced venture capitalists. Uh, these two groups, regulators on one end, investors on the other, bookend what probably most people think is the continuum of thought on financial innovation. So we look forward to hearing the similarities and differences. In addition to these great research discussions, you also will hear perspectives from our chairman, Yelena McWilliams, Secretary Steven Mnuchin, and Comptroller Joseph Adi. I believe we've assembled a great program for you today, and we are equally pleased with you, the audience. I fully expect that some of our best dialogue will arise from the many high-caliber representatives from industry, policy, and academia that are here today. So allow me just one minute for some housekeeping mat uh, matters. There are three stationary microphones located throughout the um, room. When the time comes for audience Q&A, we ask that you line up behind those mics, and we'll have a staff person there to assist. Inside your package, you can find a logistics page with some of the most important information, like where the Starbucks Cafe is located, as well as the restrooms. If you need assistance, please locate a member of our team. They have badges with navy blue ribbons on them. So we have plenty uh, ahead of you today, uh, so we'll do our best to stay on schedule. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce the FDIC chairman. Since coming to the FDIC almost one year ago, Chairman McWilliams has made understanding and adapting to technological innovation one of her top priorities. It was just last fall when she said, Diane, I want to have a FinTech research conference. So here we are today. <laughs> <laughs> we are pleased that she's given us this opportunity to hold this important discussion uh, and for promoting research inside and outside the agency with conferences like this one. Please join me in welcoming Chairman McWilliams. Thank you all for being here. And I'm pretty sure in my let's have a fintech conference, there was a please in that sentence. Um, what we didn't expect is this. We didn't expect to have uh, this much, um, um, this, much uh, this many requests for attendance and this much interest in, in the fintech conference because let's be honest, there are a lot of fintech conferences around. And so we wanted, we wanted to do a conference that um, was a little bit different, um, and what better way to do that than to invite the Secretary of the Treasury, which I'm very grateful that he was able to oblige and, and be with us today. Um, the reason I wanted to do a FinTech conference is because too often regulatory agencies play catch up. And let's be, let's be honest, regulatory agencies are not exactly on the cutting edge of just about anything. We try. Uh, banking regulatory agencies, at least, we try, but it's it's always uh, we're always almost playing catch up, and so the idea behind this conference is to bridge that gap between where the fintechs are and what is a fintech really, and to discuss the capabilities, abilities, and opportunities in the fintech space, and how regulatory agencies can be um, better prepared to respond and to set up a regulatory framework that makes sense for that future of of banking. Uh, with us today are more than 100 representatives from banks and non-banks, technology service providers, and other industry groups. We're also joined by nearly 60 representatives from federal regulators and other government agencies, dozens of policy experts and academics, lawyers, this is Washington after all, you can't have a conference without lawyers, congressional representatives, venture capitalists, and consumer groups. 
I am truly overwhelmed by your enthusiasm and um, both contributions and willingness to come here and listen and partake in, in a discussion. Thanks to your participation, we'll be able to look at a topic on our agenda from a range of perspectives. In particular, I am more than pleased, and I would like to thank Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin and Craig Phillips. Where is Craig? Craig is someplace here, I thought. Um, and OCC Director Joseph Otting, John Ryan, President of the Conference of State Bank Supervisors, and former FDIC Chairman Tom Honig for being here today. Thank you. It shouldn't escape you also that this is being held in the Sheila Bear Auditorium um, at the uh, Bill Seidman Center, two of the great former chairmen uh, of the FDIC who happen to have a crisis on their hands. Uh, putting together an event like this is no small feat. We are honored to be partners with Duke University's Fukuoka School of Business and Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative. Manju Puri and David Robinson, thank you so much. Where is Manju? Thank you so much. Uh, without you, this would not be possible, and we are very grateful for your time and, and research. And finally, I want to extend tremendous thanks to Diane Ellis and her staff at the FDIC for their hard work. I did say also thank you after I said, would you please put a conference on FinTech. We opened this morning with a conversation with Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. Uh, he doesn't need much of an introduction. As head of the Treasury Department since, since 2017, Secretary Mnuchin has been looking at the issue of fintech and innovation uh, extensively. Last year, Treasury released a report that made 80 recommendations to enable U.S. firms to more rapidly adopt competitive technologies, safeguard consumer data, and operate with greater regulatory efficiency. There will be a test on the fintech report after lunch. I'm looking forward to discussing this. I'm joking. I am looking forward to discussing these issues with him, and then the secretary would like to open up the conversation to questions from the audience. This is a unique opportunity for, for you to um, engage with the Secretary of the Treasury on this topic. We have a lot to cover today, and I don't want to take too much time, so let's get started. Secretary Mnuchin, if you would please join me on the stage. Please welcome the Secretary. Know who the fintech guy is? He's like, turn your mic on. <laughs> so it's a privilege to have you here, and thank you. I know how busy you are. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. The evolution of technology in banking is one of FDIC's highest priorities now because we believe there is a way to help small banks with their compliance regimes and being more competitive. And before we jump into your views on this topic, um, you have a very unique background that sets you up to be uh, more than credible when you speak on this topic. So would you share with us a little bit about your private and public experience uh, to, to date? Sure. Well, I, 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 first of all, I, this is basically my fourth career. Um, I think each career progressively prepared me for the next career, and, and I never would have anticipated the, the each, each one. But uh, I started in the investment banking and trading businesses where I became uh, the C a CIO. So I, although I wasn't trained as a technologist, I became a technologist. Uh, I then started my own investment business. I then bought several banks from the FDIC. So I hope there's no conference rooms named after you. We don't need a, any crisis under your leadership. <laughs> They'll, uh, name a park, they'll name a parking lot uh, after a McWilliams parking lot. After exactly. <laughs> and uh, now my fourth career in, in government, I think the best part of the, the training for this job was I traveled with the president across the country for a year during his campaign and went to all different parts of the country I had never seen and met with literally tens of thousands of big business, small business, and helped de develop the economic plan. Thank you. Um, there was an executive order and the core principles set out by the president uh, with a lot of instructions and recommendations to the independent agencies in Congress on how to look at fintech and, and uh, banking. Uh, what are some of the most important big pictures that, that you grasped from that research and, and in the report? Yeah, for, first, let me just tell you, you know, we, we did a series of reports. Uh, Craig Phillips led this for us on, on different issues. And uh, although coming into this, we had certain views, um, we had certain experience, we had certain views. One of the things that I thought it was very important that we did is we reached out on a broad basis and got a lot of input 
on, on these different issues. So we didn't want to come in. So sometimes I think people come in, they have a view, they write a report to justify the views. We, we came in and we really wanted to do a lot of research. I, I think on in FinTech, the big issue is really around innovation, making sure that we had the right balance of promoting innovation in this environment and in the regulatory environment. Thank you. Uh, one theme uh, which is important to me as well is the fintech's potential to advance financial inclusion. And I know you had a large chunk of the report focused on that. And we'll have research later today presented uh, that suggests that the use of alternative data could expand access to do those with little or no credit history. At the same time, such data sources may not ref reflect performance through a credit cycle and could raise other issues. What is your view on how we should move forward? Look, I, th I think it's great you're doing a session on this, and, and I look forward to this. I, I think financial inclusion is a very, very important issue. It's still shocking to me that we have as much of the population that is underbanked. And uh, you know, I, I'd say anything we can do with that, particularly with technology, is, is something that I think is an important thing to focus on. Thank you, and for the FDIC, it's one of our uh, um, focus areas. Um, can we talk about data aggregators for a second? Because yep. they give us an ability to, um, to look at data and the consumer and credit and decision making in that space much more quickly, but there are privacy and um, other security concerns for uh, who owns data and how that, that is being done. What are your thoughts on, on data aggregators? Look, I, th I think data and privacy, n not just in the financial sector, but in a broader sector, is, is an evolving issue and, and a very important issue. And, and really, I think there's, there's multiple aspects of this, but I would just comment on, on two parts of it, which is, I think from the consumer standpoint, having your data aggregated and being able to allow other people to ha access that data is, is important. I think you, you have lots of different sources. I think it's a very important thing. On the other hand, I think the consumer, rightfully so, expects a level of security and a level of privacy around that. Um, look, you know, in general, I like where there are private solutions as opposed to government solutions. But uh, again, I, th I think these, this data issue is an evolving issue. Um, around the world. So, I mean, one of the things I talk a lot about when we're negotiating around the world on trade is localization of data. We, we are not fans of localization. We think we live in a global world where data should be able to reside in different locations as long as it's secure. But th th this, this is a complicated issue. And, and again, I would say, you know, my view from the consumer standpoint is it should be very clear and very simple if your data is being shared who it's being shared with. And I think, you know, s s kind of, that's, it's kind of a complex issue, but that's something I think is very important. I think my staff just went back to the drawing board on this one. Um, so uh, we talk about banks partnering, partnering with fintechs and the use of technology for banks, both inside the banks and outside of banks in, in, by virtue of these partnerships. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on banks partnering with fintechs? I, th I think it's important. I mean, uh, you know, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, obviously, the big banks have the ability to create their own technology. Um, and obviously, the big banks spend a lot of money on all different types of technology. If you're a community bank or you're a regional bank, you can't afford to build it yourself. You want to be able to buy it. You want to be able to partner. And uh, I, th I think that's important. I agree. Um, can we talk a little bit about the speed of algorithmic trading and uh, what it does in the payment space as well? What are your thoughts on those issues? Um, you know, algorithmic trading, and this is something at FSOC we're beginning to study. And l let me just say, I, I want to be clear, I, I don't have concerns about this per se. So the fact that we're studying it doesn't mean we're concerned about it. But the amount of automatic trading and algorithmic trading there is in electronic trading, whether it's in the equity markets or whether it's in the government bond markets, it's a staggering amount of volume. And I, I think we just, we want to make sure that we look at this and particularly in volatile markets where kind of some, some of these players have the option of just exiting the market. Um, one of my questions and we're going to study is, does it really create more liquidity or does it create less liquidity? Um, so that, that's an important issue. I think the other issue is obviously from a cyber standpoint, 
Um, we want to make sure, again, I think cyber is just a, a large issue overall and something we want to make sure that the, the trading infrastructures are protected. And then on the payment space, um, you know, again, I, I think the payment space is an evolving sp space. I mean, I, I think it's actually quite efficient, but that's an area also where innovation will continue. And I know from my um, from several discussions with you, discussions with you, that cybersecurity is very important to you, um, and just cyberspace in general. And um, there, there have been numerous FIBIC exercises, and we talk about it at the FSOC, and we talk about it in meetings. Are you pleased with the with the developments to date and the coordination among the agencies? Uh, I, I am, but I think there's there's more work to be done, and you know, cyber is obviously an issue. So the Department of Homeland Security has overall responsibility for cyber here. Treasury has responsibility under them for the financial, financial infrastructure. And we've participated in, in, in a series of exercises with the regulators. And I think it's been a it's been a helpful process, I think, for all of us. I mean, we've, we, we've gone through these exercises and you realize, particularly in a global world, where you have these issues, you know, how you're running against a clock in, in dealing with these issues. And we actually just had a productive meeting last week where we had a bunch of the bank CEOs. They were kind of called in for another reason. You may have seen them on TV, but as long as they were in Washington, uh, we, 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 we invited them in and we, we had a very productive meeting. Because again, I think for the private sector, it's got to be a public-private partnership. And um, one of the recommendations in the FinTech report uh, that uh, you issued was how can regulators um, better prepare to encourage innovation? Are you pleased uh, with efforts to date? Are we at the tip of the iceberg? Are we at the beginning? Are we, where are we and how do you feel about it? I, I think you're at the beginning. I mean, I, I think it's good. And by the way, I don't think there's, a, there's not a one size fit all answer to this that you know, as regulators, you, you play important roles and you don't want to move too quickly. But on the other hand, you don't want to move too slow. You want to encourage innovation. So I think there's a little bit of a debate as to who's the better regulator in the room. I understand there's multiple Joseph. regulators. Nice. I won't go there, but uh, I think you're all doing a great job. It's an inside joke. I invited uh, OCC controller uh, Joseph Otting, who's a good friend of mine, to uh, speak today. And I said, the only way you can speak is if you start by saying that I'm a better regulator. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see how his 10 minutes go. Um, so let me, let me ask you this, and then I want to I wanna turn it to the audience to make sure that we, get, we have input from them as well. Um, you run a tremendous agency, and there are several agencies under Treasury, and one of them is IRS, where you know innovation and use of data can be tricky, mm -hmm. uh, given the nature of the agency and all of that. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. So, uh, you know, the IRS is something I've spent a lot of time on. Matter of fact, yesterday they had, uh, I think for the first time in, in a long time, 300 of their senior executives in. And one of the things I talked a lot about was technology. So we've just worked with them on a six-year modernization plan. You may say, well, why was it six years? We couldn't get it, everything we wanted done in five years, and I think 10-year plans are just too long to, to enact. But uh, we, we've under-invested significantly in technology at the IRS, and it's, it, it's a major priority. And, and one, we want to have better technology with consumers, with taxpayers. We need to be able to deliver services, uh, we, how, how the IRS does business, and also just from a cyber standpoint, we're probably the most attacked network in the world. So it's, uh, it's a big part of what we're going to do with them going forward. So may I ask you a fun question? Uh, absolutely. All right. So you have had a lot of experience in the private sector. Uh, one of them was making movies. What is your favorite movie? So that's a really good question. But now I'm a more experienced political person. I was asked this early on when I took this job. And despite my giving warnings that I wasn't promoting a film that I had an interest in, I was accused of promoting a film. So being the better politician at this point, and it's open press, I'm just going to say, go see films in general, and I'm not going to tell you my favorite. <laughs> Go see American films. <laughs> I think that's a code word for something, but for now we'll use this as a code word to open up uh, questions to the audience.
You left them. We, we know this is not a bashful group. <laughs> Greetings. Uh, I'm a college professor, Virginia Tech, and Fabulous. Florida State. And I was interested in your first comment that you were so surprised at the number of unbanked in America. And I wondered, uh, what is your explanation for that? Well, since you're the college professor, I think you should give us the explanation <laughs> because, <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's. I don't think there's any one answer to be honest with you, and, and it's something I'm still surprised by because we've been talking about, when I say we, not just me, the industry has been talking about this for a long time. The regulators have been talking about this. Um, you know, kind of, uh, I, I, th I think there's, a, there's no single one reason. If there was one reason, it wouldn't be the case. So I, I think this is something that, from all of our standpoints, from government, from private, from fintech to college professors, we need to figure out the multiple reasons and attack it one by one. And I, I, if I were a business person, I would tell you, um, I would try to promote my um, our FDIC study on unbanked and underbanked, but since I'm not, go see the study on unbanked and underbanked. <laughs> Thank you. Hey there, uh, Jackson Miller with the Milken Institute Center for Bank Markets. Uh, thank you to both FBIC and, and Duke for putting this event together. It's uh, fantastic. Uh, my question relates to the Treasury's report back in, that feels like 10 years ago, but back in uh, June or July, it was released on, on FinTech, 80 plus recommendations. I'd be interested in uh, are there a few recommendations or a recommendation that Treasury's really focused on at this point, and will we see kind of further developments uh, from Treasury as it relates to some of the recommendations? You know, I mean, first of all, thank you. And uh, I know at Milken, you do a lot of great work across the board on, on a lot of these issues. Um, again, I think when we put out those reports, kind of, we wanted to put out a lot of information. I think, you know, one of the, the roles the Treasury has is we can convene people in this case, or whether it's FSOC or other things working with the regulators. I, I don't think there's really, it's not like there's two or three things that we want to get done and, and are not the rust. But again, I think the, the themes that ran through the report are, ve are very important. And look, I, I appreciate all the work the regulators have done on not just this report, but on, on other reports. I mean, I think, you know, kind of these have become a little bit of the blueprint of, of different things for the collective group to work on. Thank you. Uh, Dan Geller with Analyticum. Secretary Mnuchin, um, in the last financial crisis, we were pretty much caught by surprise. And what do we have as far as an early warning system for the next recession? Well, there's two, 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 two different issues because I think, you know, financial crisis and recession, you, you can have a recession without a financial crisis. And, you know, you could probably also have a financial crisis without a recession. You know, l let me first comment on the recession, and then I'll, I'll comment on the financial crisis. Um, I think the U.S. economic environment, you know, and I'd say I have visibility for call it 18 to 24 months. I think the U.S. Uh, economic environment is, is really the bright spot around the world. And what I see from speaking to all my other finance ministers, you know, Europe is in a real slowdown. So there's no question whether it's Italy or Germany. Italy's growth has slowed down a lot. Um, China has slowed down. I think it's not quite the concern that it was in December, but it's clearly slowed down. And I think whether it's a result of our tax reform or other economic issues, you still have a lot of money coming back into the U.S. So I, th I think the U.S. economy looks quite productive. Um, now, going to the the... So I don't believe the traditional predictors of recessions. People will say, oh, look at the yield curves. And you know, people would ask me, you know, what I, do I get worried about inverted yield curves? And the answer is not at all, because the yield curve is just the market's interpretation of where interest rates will be. So um, sometimes markets are right, sometimes markets aren't right. I would say on the financial crisis, I mean, 
if there was a great predictor of a financial crisis, we'd never have a financial crisis. And you know, I, I think these things are always much more obvious in hindsight than they are at the time. So I think the important issue is from us to learn from the issues that we've experienced before and try not to have those same issues developed. So, you know, I, the next crisis isn't going to be like the previous one. Obviously, from the banking standpoint, banks are very, very well capitalized today. I think kind of the real estate issue, you know, kind of, a, you know, I think when you look at the real estate crisis, there was a lot of blame to go around. Um, and I think on the real estate basis, we've done a lot of work. One of the things I, I'm working on uh, is trying to figure out whether we can get housing reform done. And when I say housing reform, it's not just GSC reform. Um, it's a combination of GSC reform, figuring out if we can get Fannie and Freddie out of conservatorship, but also making sure that we don't end up with too much risk at FHA. So we're working with HUD. Uh, and you know, I'm somewhat hopeful that in the next six months, we can try to get something done on a bipartisan basis. And I'll be happy with the McWilliams parking lot at the FDIC if we don't have a crisis. <laughs> Go ahead. Could you comment on the administration's policy about the further consolidation or consolidation of independent regulatory agencies? Question one. Question two is that the administration issued a policy statement about the request that, in, that the agencies um, submit their proposed rules for approval before going forward with them, the intent of that policy vis-a-vis -vis independent agencies? So, I mean, on, on the independent agencies, I think the first question, I assume it was geared to financial agencies and not agencies across the board. Um, I, I don't think we, you know, I don't think we have a view of any consolidation at this point of the independent agencies. I think that they're, they're functioning well. Um, you know, I think there was, there's, this is something that people, we looked at early on, uh, whether there was a need and whether there was efficiencies. And I, I don't think there's anything particular at the moment that is, is top of the priority. And then your second question had to do with proposed rulemaking. Is, is that right? Yes. Yeah, and I'll, we're already doing a lot of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave that one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on, on answering that question. I'm going to leave that one alone, too. <laughs> I mean, I, I would just say, I, I think in, I, I will make a broad comment on, on rulemaking. OK, and this is, again, not just geared towards. Um, we are a favor of putting things out for public comment and making sure that, it, you know, kind of there is a robust process on rulemaking. Uh, thank you, Secretary Mnuchin and uh, Chairman McWilliams for taking the time. Uh, my name is Dipanjan. I'm from Cap One. Uh, quick question for you guys. Um, you mentioned uh, about innovation in the payments uh, space. Um, as I look at sort of some of the things that's happening in Europe, like, you know, open banking and PSD2, um, even sort of the regulatory environment and the ease of getting sort of banking charters, uh, do you think some of these things will migrate over to Europe, especially things like open banking and PSD2? And second part is, uh, you know, generally, if you sort of zoom out, do you feel like you know, the level of innovation in these areas is a little bit like we kind of play a little bit of catch up in the U.S. compared to Europe in these areas. No, I don't, I don't, th I don't think we pay catch up uh, at, at all. I mean, I think, you know, in general, we have more evolved markets. And when you have more evolved markets, you tend to want to be a little bit more careful in, in how they change. I mean, I, I, I think the U.S. is really the leader in really uh, a, a lot of technology and engineering and everything else. There are big markets where, you know, kind of there's nothing and it's a lot, it's a lot easier to start these things. Um, and whether it was China or India or, or, or other things when you're starting from scratch. Now, I will I'll, we'll make one comment, okay? And this is something we need to balance on, on innovation. So uh, 
th there was a lot of things I had a lot of experience coming into government with. The one area I had no experience, and I'm happy to say I had no experience and I kind of got a crash course PhD in, was sanctions. So at Treasury, we manage all the sanctions programs, and, and I probably spend half my time on this. And sanctions are very important. Uh, combating financial terrorism is very important. So one of the things I, you know, I think of is, as we talk about innovation is in the United States, kind of we have our, our anti-money laundering laws apply, okay, to whether it's crypto assets or, or wallets and things like that. Um, I think we got to be careful as we talk about innovation and, and we got to strike the right balance of kind of making sure that our financial system isn't used for bad purposes with creating enough innovation that we don't have bureaucracy around that. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dennis Santiago. I'm with uh, Total Financial Solutions, but I have a, more of an academic question for you. Well, today. you should ask the professor then. <laughs> uh, well, so my question involves millennials who are now beginning to be a significant factor in the workforce. And uh, all the research shows that they have vastly different definitions of wealth, wealth accumulation, spending, and the culture of participating in the economy. So my question is, uh, you know, uh, have you seen from a uh, agency perspective the impact of this growing proportion of the US population and its impact on the economy? And I'm not asking for an answer today because I know it's a big question, but to what degree have studies begun to look forward to this? Because this is, it strikes me as something that we're gonna have to deal with over the next decade or so. Well, it's, it, it clearly, um, it, it is a group that's had a big impact on the economy. Um, I, I don't think we've done any studies per se, but I'm, I'm sure there are studies out there. And look, on, on, on all these issues, uh, I think they're important issues. And again, we, we talk about uh, underbanked. You know, another issue we focus on a lot is retirement savings. And what, what can we do? to continue to encourage retirement savings in, in, in the retirement systems. I mean, the one thing about being the Treasury Secretary, I, I have, I get involved in a lot of things across the government. Ye yesterday I was at my PBGC board meeting. Um, but I, I think there are a lot of complicated issues that impact millennials, but that we can also use more broadly. Hi, uh, Chairman McWilliams, Secretary Mnuchin, Lisa Rabb from Stratosphere Advisors. I come from a large financial institution background, but I'm now working with startups. And I had two regulatory questions for you. The first is, what role do you see for regulatory technology in helping with the compliance burdens and costs for large and small banks alike, and also, of course, for regulators like the FTC itself? Um, and second question, how do you see the potential for maybe some use, clever use of regulatory opportunity, things like the Community Reinvestment Act, to help provide incentives for small community banks to engage more with the underbanked? Well, uh, on the CRA question, I'm going to leave that to uh, Joseph Odding, who's speaking afterwards. Joseph has done a great job looking at CRA across the agencies. Um, uh, my own view is banks spend a lot of money on CRA, and they're willing to spend a lot of money. Um, I think we need to figure out whether it's really being spent in the right ways in helping communities. But uh, I'm, I'm going to let Joseph talk more about that. On the use of technology within institutions for regulatory purposes, I think that's something that's very important, specifically for small and medium-sized banks, where you know, again, the compliance burden is very expensive and you can't build proprietary technology. And from the regulatory standpoint, I'm going to let you answer that. Uh, I will talk about it at lunch. I, don't, I think we only have three minutes and 20 seconds left, and I want to make sure that people get a chance to, uh, Good. to, to uh, ask at least one more question. Uh, I think Mark, also from the Milken Institute. Uh, you mentioned that if your data is being shared, you should know who it's being shared with, something I think most of us would strongly agree with. 
I'm curious, what do you think the best way is to do that, at least in the context of financial data? How do we make sure that consumers are aware who the data is being shared with? Um, you know, again, I, I think it's it's without getting really technical on on this. I think the answer is, you know, um, it's probably more of an opt in than an opt out model. But it it should be something where you know an average person can understand pretty clearly what what's being done with their data. And I mean, I, you know, I'm relatively sophisticated and, and, and I sometimes download apps and things like that and I don't really understand. And sometimes when I actually read it, I actually delete the apps. <laughs> but um, I think it's gotta be a much more user-friendly basis. Something the Milken Institute can study. <laughs> next, next week, next week. All right, one more question. We have two minutes left. You, you know, for a fintech conference, we can't have those signs in the back. We, we got, we, we, <laughs> we, we, we got, we got the clock. I, I, I appreciate that, but I mean, it, it looks a little old world for a fintech conference. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> in case the clock goes down, it's good to have backup. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Maxwell Leary with um, WebBank. I was just curious in terms of uh, bank partnerships and fintechs. Um, how regulators plan to move forward with the solution to uh, Madden versus Midland um, or true lender issues. And then I was also just curious um, if you guys have any, or if you guys maintain your own um, opinion on how marketplace lenders' um, assets will perform during a cycle. So maybe I'll take the first one at lunch, Good. and if you want to take the second one on marketplace um, assets, lenders' assets at uh, in, in throughout the cycle. If you, you, you go first. Uh, no, no, I don't want to. I, I only take easy questions. <laughs> All the difficult ones go to you. Um, the, uh, we'll take, we'll, we're taking a look at the true lender issue uh, at the FDIC and exactly what that means uh, and looking at uh, the court decision and, and trying to figure out what's the appropriate uh, place for the FDIC vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the court decision. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, through the cycle, I, I think you have seen in the last 10 years or so, more than a decade, a lot of the banking services shift to the non-banking, uh, uh, in the non-banking, to non-banking firms. And uh, part of that is also that you have now the marketplace lending uh, being uh, quite predominant in, in many areas of traditional banking services. And uh, we have not had really an opportunity to take a look at a full cycle to see how those assets will perform and how those entities will fare. And it's something that the FDIC is taking a look at very carefully and trying to study. All right, we have 13 seconds. Aaron, uh, you know what? I know Aaron Klein from Brookings, so I have to give you those, those 12 seconds. Go. Th very, very quick, thank you, Yelena. Uh, Treasury Secretary, following up on a prior question, uh, England developed real-time payments 12 years ago. You can cash a payment faster in Portugal from Latvia than you can from Kansas uh, to M Montana. Your report very eloquently urged the Fed to move on faster payments, but it's been almost a year since your report, 12 years since England has done this. Uh, why aren't we going any faster in our payment system? Never mind, your 12 seconds have been revoked. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Fed has lots of priorities. <laughs> you, you'll, you, you'll have to follow up with the Fed. Thank you, Aaron. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank you. This is Pleasure phenomenal. It is not often that a Secretary of the Treasury will come to the FDIC I'm during peacetime. Always peace happy time. to come back. So, thank you for that. And please uh, welcome and thank the Secretary with a round of applause. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, very much.